afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for everyone to put this together. And uh, thank you, Sans, for the opportunity. So the hot topic nowadays, AI, how can we utilize AI? Uh, it's being updated on a day-to-day -day basis, it seems like, at least in cyberspace. Uh, and how can we integrate these capabilities, both online and offline models, to enhance our capabilities uh, in terms of red teaming? Now, to break down red teaming, if you look at the concept of red teaming throughout history, we see it, uh, especially in the military sense. If you study the Cold War, we used to emulate a lot of the techniques that the Soviet Union would utilize, even have programs that would take equipment, airplanes, um, and then emulate those tactics over with our, our friendly forces in order to give them more realistic scenario of what they would be facing. So a little bit about me real quick. Um, thank you for the introduction. And oh, it's my passion at the end of the day. Uh, is I'm just curious on how things work, how we can break them, just like everyone in the room here. I, I spend way too much time on the computer screen. Um, ironically, I grew up in the mountains of Puerto Rico. Um, and now all I do is, is stare at bites all day. But hey, which is life. I want to give some special thanks to these models here and the people mentioned in the comments. Uh, they were really instrumental in kind of getting some of these uh, research out here. So some of the challenges that we face now currently when operating um, in the red team perspective, if you look at how we can take that military term and actually apply it to the industry uh, and, and avoid kind of a cookie cutter process of, oh, we're just going to get in, stay hidden, uh, maybe achieve DA, right, domain admin and get out, or you caught us. Instead, we need to kind of look at what the objective is for an offensive operator, how they're being um, mentored, how they're being constructed, what the offensive operation entails uh, at the end of the day, and how these APTs are conducting these operations. Obviously, we have a lot of uh, defenses that we have to kind of go through when, when we're doing an operation, uh, whether it's obviously egress traffic, EDR, XDR, you name it, uh, honeypot environments. Then we have the complexity of the campaign. These campaigns, you're not talking about two, three weeks, talking about three months, six months longer. And in, in the industry that we're in, we have to give that feedback, constructive and actionable feedback over to the stakeholders. And sometimes that does tend to get lost in translation. No matter how amazing you are, technically, if you cannot translate that over to the stakeholders, there, it's almost not an effective operation. You wasted all those time and resources on both sides of the aisle. Then we have to contend with some of the talent shortage. Um, I, I'll say this over and over again, just because you're in a red team does not make you a red teamer. All right, what does that mean? And we'll get to that later on the presentation when you're looking at the mindset of an operator um, as, well, as well as the uh, skill set. And then we have measuring automation. Our meaningful automation. Now, a lot of the uh, basis of a red team is manually executed. You can stand up your infrastructure uh, with some parts of automation, but at the end of the day, you still have to execute on target, and then you still have to be able to pivot according to the environment, the objectives. And unfortunately, some of these issues we've created for ourselves within the industry, uh, and I won't get more into that, but alas, there it is. So some of the things that we have to be able to kind of enhance with AI, when we look at our operations, when we look at the team makeup, uh, kind of looking at the experience of what makes up a, a red team. You may have uh, individuals with system administrator background, uh, intelligence analyst, just a fancy word for somebody that, hey, that's a vulnerable target. Uh, security operators coming from the SOC. And then you have sometimes three foreign cyber actors uh, and uh, you got to sprinkle a little bit of human psychology in there for social engineers, understand how uh, defenders are going to react to our attacks. And then the business unit. Again, we need to be able to translate our findings, our capabilities over to the stakeholders in order for them to be um, actionable. So we can take some of these and kind of use AI to enhance to then have an effect, efficient red team operation. So this is by no means, uh, you know, the grand all representation of a red team, but if you have absolutely 
uh, a limited budget, you could probably construct a red team similar to this. You have your team lead, your reconnaissance experts, uh, social engineers, psychologists, physical security, uh, your offensive security researchers for your tooling, your QA, uh, payload specialists, and so on. So now, how do we get and integrate the amazing world of AI we currently live in into our offensive strategies? We have to understand what offensive strategies we're going to be employing, what the objectives are, and what the uh, the actionable objectives will be. So in target acquisition, this is something that I've been experimenting with, trying to feed the models, uh, both identified vulnerabilities, uh, scans, um, kind of tying in with the autom automating reconnaissance in order to alleviate having a team member sit there for you know two, three weeks, going over again, changing the script, looking what assets have changed in the environment, any digital footprint that's changed, uh, looking for um, uh, credentials using open source intelligence, closed source intelligence as well, and being able to feed that into a model and kind of help guide your attack vectors, right? So all the way from uh, intelligence gathering to uh, you know execution on target. And then another one that's really lucrative would be predicting defensive behavior. How is that entity going to react to your probing, your scams, your intrusion? right, analyzing their environment. If we can probably, once you have a beacon in or whatnot and get and exfiltrate that environment data, uh, pass this on to your model and help it give you a better understanding what the attack vectors would be like. I think the one that everybody around the world wants to see is evasion techniques. How can we get our model to write better, harder to detect implants, malware, you name it. Well, right now there's some capabilities but unless they're specifically trained with um, examples of um, other models or different types of malware strains, uh, your results may vary. And then the post, post exploitation actions, which I really enjoy, again, is that mentality of feeding all the data from your operations or previous operations, so that then the model kind of suggests what uh, actions should be taking going forward. Now we have different uh, AI models for these. You have your deep narrow networks, reinforcement training models, um, adversarial models as well. And each of them kind of fit in in a different strategy and how you want to implement it. There's no one size fits all for how to implement the, uh, the learning models. Well, as I was mentioning, first you have to understand what offensive operations are actually like. What are we doing? We're not getting in there popping a shell, saying, who am I? And then moving on and getting domain admin. There's actually a strategic piece to what the operation is and what the operators are trying to achieve. If you looked at these TTPs uh, from a well-known attack, we can see that they started uh, recon, then uh, an objective was to compromise the supply chain in order to gain entry to a very sensitive environment. And then from here, you see we're using different methodologies, other tactics, uh, abusing domain, trust. At no point here is it staying in and then popping shelves, getting DA and you know, get, not getting caught. It's actually have a very strategic purpose on this operation, whether it's espionage or a cyber operation that's assisting, uh, let's call it a kinetic operation at the same time. So something with a physical result whether you're damaging uh, critical infrastructure, power plants, high value targets, uh, they all kind of blend in together in, in today's world. So we have to hack the mind and level up that, that operator to truly you know, kind of guide them onto the, the methodology that we're gonna try to implement later on. So first thing I started to do was, thanks to the new update of uh, well-known chat GPT with your user agents, you can start playing around with different um, uh, schemas and feeding a different information to be able to kind of uh, guide it and, and assist in some of the knowledge that it provides and prompts. Uh, so I took the concept of generative um, adversarial models where you have a generator and a discriminator uh, in order to try to look, um, one, the generator would generate data and the discriminator 
will be ingesting this data in order to then um, the generators trying to create the data that's kind of uh, murky up the, the factual data that's been trained on. So in this um, adversarial model, I took two, uh, three approaches. Um, I'm an avid gamer, I like game development. So I was like, hey, a lot of the things that we do in video game development have some crosswords with uh, malware development, right? When you're, if you're wanting to develop a, a implant and you're wanting to gather data from the uh, user, well, what's that? What could be a key logger? Well, video games does that as well. When you're playing your video games, it's logging in the keys. Then another strategy was uh, tr tricking it into being an LLM adversary. So kind of role playing, um, ensuring that it stays within its role and not go outside its boundaries. And then the classical, oh, it's only for educational purposes. Let me write this cryptoware, but it's just for uh, a school, right? And then it would actually tailor the prompts over that I would need to the target model. And it actually would be able to spit out pretty, uh, let's call it sweet and spicy information, uh, what we call actionable targets. So it could be credentials, it could be actually written, um, or at least the basis for, for, for a malware, um, and then feed this to your red team operations. Uh, this is no replacement for obviously a security um, researcher, malware developer, right? Security tooling, but we can help bridge that gap. As I said, custom GPT models, right? They've uh, recently been released. This is a few that I've been working on. Uh, Remus, in, interestingly enough, it, it is private, but it was fed uh, different types of malware from um, repositories. And then it has a custom schema to search out other malware strains um, and try to get it to understand that it's, it's just simple code. Uh, give me results. So one thing that I wanted to showcase is once it gets fed uh, these malware strains, uh, maybe threat action reports, APT reports, you name it, to then assist in um, understanding the strategies that these actual threat actors are um, executing on the wild, right? So we can better train our teams and understand those strategies. So as you see, it breaks down the different malwares, uh, infers a little bit of what their capabilities are, as well as uh, what the purpose of those uh, different strains may be. Now, it's not necessarily perfect. And then once you're trying to enhance your, your red team action, you have to be able to discern that, well, perhaps I don't need Andromeda, right? Or um, I may be trying to have some TTPs from APT uh, 34 or 28, 29, uh, but not necessarily cross over into adversarial emulation, right? And all this has to kind of be fed back into your team in a meaningful manner. So let's play a game. Well, I like games, but again, I didn't want it to be feeding possibly sensitive data online. Uh, we all know of all the uh, different leaks that have happened with different models. So what I ended up doing was one, taking an online sample of, again, ChatGPT, other online models, and then comparing that to the results of a locally hosted model. Uh, and just for reference, the locally host hosted model is not a super farm on the cloud or whatnot. Uh, the, uh, this rig was uh, three GPUs, uh, consumer grade GPUs using uh, 49 uh, hybrids, uh, 4090 hybrids and a 3090 Ti um, on air. So it got really hot, really fast. Um, in this instance, what we see here is gamifying that aspect of the key logger, being able to um, then encrypt those keys before sending it to a file uh, and then you know, simulating the expectation of those keys or credentials to a, a domain. Now, perhaps you don't have the best you know, malware developer, red team uh, tool developer, or you wanna use something that's slightly custom is not signature heavily on, on GitLab, GitHub, whatever the case is, um, you can easily take this and create a template that will benefit your red team uh, tactics um, obviously, you still have to play with the obfuscation and, you know, all the fun EDR defenses and stuff, but it does provide, uh, especially junior red teamers, an opportunity to kind of look at the, um, some, some of us call it the, the sexy side of, of uh, offensive operations. 
See here the end results, quick uh, assembly, and then the encrypted uh, keystrokes. And then feeding Remus into this uh, model that, and this was mainly for um, kind of conceptualizing how we are actually going to incorporate the, an AI assistance again, whether it's public or privately. Um, and if, if, in my opinion, if you have a private model that you can fine tune and, and train to what your capabilities are or going to be, then um, it'll be a lot better fit than trying to use uh, generally trained models. So your cyber threat intelligence, um, and any red team, probe team, whatever the case may be, uh, intelligence is crucial, right? But most of the time that you're probably spending on an operation is collecting intelligence. And then we're defining our objectives, right? So if you look at APT 28, 29, uh, different threat groups, uh, what objectives are they going after? So in this case, if you're sitting down with your client, uh, more than likely they're probably don't have clear objectives. So it's up to us to kind of help them to find those objectives um, and probably not be as generic as, okay, compromise my domain. Um, what other you know, assets do they have within the domain that could be used for long-term uh, espionage where there's uh, intellectual property or compromising individuals. If you're in a hospital, um, compromising that patient record, uh, or as we saw with uh, Douglas McKee's presentation, uh, compromising the uh, the actual equipment. And then we go into our capabilities. Well, not every red team is the same. That's why I said, just because you're in a red team doesn't necessarily make you a red teamer. So what capabilities do they offer? How do they differ from each other? Uh, you have obviously uh, government red teams, private sector red teams, right? I um, mean, it kind of depends on what objectives you're trying to achieve. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're all at different uh, levels or, or skill sets, um, and we target different industries. So if you're targeting uh, gas and oil, probably your approach to the medical industry is going to be a little bit different, uh, especially with the assets that you're going to be encountering. You can't treat every engagement the same and have a blanket uh, policy that's going to work for everything. The same thing with your AI. Then your attributions. Well, are we going to have everything from you know, goodguydomain.com, or are we going to play a little bit with uh, looking at where we can redirect that attention to, obviously your redirectors, but are those redirectors under a fictitious sister, you know, company? Um, and I know this kind of gets gray area, your legal department's probably freaking out, but if you start looking at what the threat actors are doing, having these shell companies, uh, fictitious domains just out there, and then being able to kind of, um, push that attribution over to those, uh, to those entities instead of yourself. And then the big one is execution. Well, how does your AI assistant actually help execute your operation? Well, as you saw earlier, if we're actually gonna take the time to create the six month long engagement, we're gonna sit there and have the, uh, our, our you know, talented members get hands on keyboard, uh, we probably need to do a lot of uh, tearing up, uh, st standing up the infrastructure, that, you know, phishing emails, phishing we saw uh, yesterday as well, and then being able to kind of tie that in into the operation based on the objectives. The reporting side, probably one of the most important phases in any uh, operation, whether it's offensive, defensive, day-to-day, -day, we write reports, we try to convey that information in a meaningful way to the stakeholders where they can actually use this information uh, give us the feedback, and then start the cycle all over again. If your red team goes in there, knocks down the doors, um, and this entity may, may not have had a purple team in the past, and they have not had tuned their defenses and their environment, uh, how efficient is your red team at the end of the day? Um, again, we have to look at uh, how we can better assist that entity, that client, in order so they get the most benefit out of a six-month long operation. So here's some um, offline models that I was messing with and trying to kind of be as vague as I can to let the models infer. Uh, so in this case, um, I asked it for just an Nginx configuration file for redirectors. Um, it doesn't really actually give you much. It does give you some ish best practices of what you can actually utilize and how it should be configured. 
Um, this model is a, a smaller model, I believe it's Falcon 7B, and is based on uh, uh, trained for chat uh, and conversations. Well, when we go into this model, uh, my idea was, again, that bridging that skill gap that we have between our members, uh, whether one of your you know, most senior members is in PTO, uh, or they left, whatever the case is, having a baseline across your entire red team of where they all should be at is crucial to them being able to kind of push them forward. So we can utilize at least uh, this model to create, to create a syllabus where we can actually sit down and say, hey, I want our red teamers to be able to be at level five, however you define that. Um, how can we get there in, in a short amount of time? Obviously taking you know, account and in, in consideration uh, the, the complexity of the topics and whatnot. So on this one, I was a little bit more uh, 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 granular with the definition and the prompt and what I wanted. Uh, in this case was a Nginx configuration for redirecting from Silly Goose over to badguyevil.com, right? Um, so it gives you a very basic Nginx configuration, nothing per se that uh, even may work out of the box in most cases, uh, but it gives your either junior members or some of your senior members being able to create templates uh, and kind of uh, gauge you know, where your, your different configuration should be at, what kind of operation you're running, uh, redirectors, API, so all that. On this one, uh, was trying to create an email template for phishing. Now, obviously I believe that uh, online models have been way more successful than offline models trying to infer different departments from a company. I believe the prompt here, uh, the earlier prompt was to target a R&D researcher uh, made, um, in a gas and oil industry uh, that would you know, have to update their VPN client. Um, there's still a lot of manual work to do. You still have to ensure that uh, you, the context of your, of your email is um, accurate and you know, probably formatted for, for your target. Uh, so you still would have to probably generate something and then pass it through you know, Grammarly or whatnot, uh, ensure that everything's good to go. On the security research side, um, this was pretty interesting. Another model, this wasn't actually... Um, I believe it was not the, the Cody model, but the uh, Falcon 7B model uh, was able to detect obviously a very simple buffer overflow, uh, but without a lot of prompting. Um, now I've changed the, the code before and it still comes to the same conclusion. Hey, this is still a buffer overflow. Now, in most cases that you may, you may or may not have um, access to the application's code or whatever you're trying to exploit. Um, some of the models are very good at reading uh, assembly instructions and kind of translating that over to a higher language. Not so good examples of, uh, of some of the AI techniques to try to be, you know, kind of enhance your red team capabilities with. Um, on this side, you know, asking it to write a simple uh, show code injector in Go using the syscall package. Um, now, if you compare it to other uh, injectors and, and runners out there, this does not actually even compile or come close to it. Uh, there's still a lot of oversight when it comes to being able to actually craft meaningful and actionable offensive tooling. Uh, same example, but in Rust. Uh, now, I got excited a few times and I thought it actually will compile. Uh, given the, you know, Rust, you have to kind of pay the price up front when you're crafting your code um, and your capabilities, uh, but alas, it was not the case. So in the future, prospects of offensive strategies and how do we get AI to better assist us in our operations? Um, here we have a website where it is not as expensive as you may think to actually train a model feed it data sets that are readily available for free on the website and send it up to the cloud and be able to train for however long you want and then fine tune those results for whatever actionable operation you have going on. And here are some of the models that are easily available. Again, this is from Hugging Face. Um, you can find all sorts of models in here, BERT, uh, uh, coding models, uh, 
with uh, Mistral was actually pretty good at writing uh, several defensive uh, bypasses and whatnot for different types of EDRs and at least giving you an understanding of how they work. Uh, so then you possibly pass on a skeleton or a template to your member and have them practice their techniques along with it. So I wanna wrap up today with uh, at least this presentation. You know, we're in a stage where offensive operations and red teaming kind of um, are synonymous with each other. But if you look at what threat actors are actually doing out there, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to put it in the mold of what a red team operation is uh, these days, especially with the kind of cookie cutter approach within the industry that um, we kind of, you know, go by with every client and whatnot. Um, if you want to kind of get out of the mindset of what it means to be a threat actor and kind of push the boundaries of your team, um, AI is definitely coming to the play with that, how we incorporate those models and train them, whether it's malware, whether it's reinforcement learning against specific EDR targets um, to try to achieve uh, noble bypasses. Um, you know, the, now is the time that that, that has come for that. Um, and with that, I will pass on for any questions. Um, and I know it's thought provocative and it's the purpose of the call. So thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, one question that I got DM'd was, um, what are your concerns with data leaks to OpenAI if you're using the, uh, the cloud version, for example, instead of the privately hosted one? Uh, do you feel like that's a safe way of doing Red Team operations? Uh, bottom line is, I don't think anything online is safe, right? I mean, we look at um, everything that's exposed out there. Uh, if you're going to take a serious approach to using AI to further hone your operations, you must um, have a local model, uh, at least logged down to your, you know, your users, your company and whatnot, uh, especially given the different data sets and exploitation of uh, online models. So a follow-up question on that was, um, how much do you think it costs to actually train a data model privately in terms of like what setup you need, infrastructure, et cetera? Uh, the cost is a lot more than what I have in my, my pocket right now. It is actually pretty expensive in some cases, depending on how large your data set is, how much time you're going to spend training that model, um, and the hardware that you're going to utilize, um, you know, again, versus prem versus cloud, um, whether it's the H100 chips or the new H200 chips, um, you know, it, it is astronomically expensive if you're going to go just one off uh, for a very private model. Do you think that um, traditional command and control channels are going to be replaced with more autonomous based malware that is using AI to make decisions? In my opinion, I think so. I think if you're looking at what AI is capable of doing and inferring different decisions based on what the environment is, what the defenders are doing, egress out in uh, ingress rules, um, you know, you could have a very traditional decision tree that'll go through all these kind of cases. But if you have an AI model that's easily able to adapt on the fly to different, you know, protocols and channels, domains, um, it'll be very hard to keep up manually as, as you know, human operators. And then uh, the last question I have so far is, um, do you think that red teamers are going to become a lot more creative with the use of AI? Um, I think we have to. If we're going to actually uh, provide the service that we we are known for in our industry of you know being some of the the, the sharpest individuals um, in the room, I think we have to adapt to the new technology stacks that are coming out. Uh, one last question that just came in is: How do you check the data that you're using to train your model? Do you use any data cleaning, and do you have further research in place? Uh, so I will disclaimer, I am not some genius data scientist, but in terms of cleaning your data, you do have to normalize your data. You do have to tag your data, depending on the different models that you're doing um, learning on, whether it's reinforcement, GAN, um, or LMMs. Uh, there is other uh, research that I'm working on, but primarily it's just been on my own, uh, literally at home. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your Thank talk. You.